good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Deepika Sarah. Now we had a meeting on 30th of January with the Minister of Health, where we were called to giving data for uh, giving us uh, making the indicators of the SDGs. What where is India standing in the uh, sort of sustainable development goals? What is our what are the data that we have, and are we going to achieve it? So I said that we have this wonderful study on it because they showed in their grid that there is no data on air pollution with them. I said we have this set study and we have this data, please include it. So they said no, 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 we will take it from the environmental ministry only. So you know these are the issues that we really need to take care of. We have a wonderful study, we are telling them, now what? I congratulate the three speakers. My name is uh, Dr. Murthy. I'm a professional traffic engineer from California. And all the topics are very much pertinent to India and the way in the offshore, all the graphs and everything and the satellite pictures. But my, I've been working in India only for the last nine months. What I find is the development is good. India has to move forward and it's moving rapidly in the 21st century. But the major problem is here in India, it is growing in a rapid pace in the airline industry. You had about 600 flights around 1997. Today you have 6,000 local flights. The 1747 when it takes off and lands with the new planes which are now 800 what they call 800. Take off and land, believe it or not, they produce 100,000 vehicles pollution. 7,000 liters of fuel is burnt when they take off. The reason why, they are carrying 30 tons up in the air. For a one ton car that are moving on the road, they do produce pollution. But when, it, when you compare one flight taking off and landing, 7,000 liters is being burned to bring them down to go up. So, India should pay a Brookings, I would recommend Brookings to go after. The airline industry is very powerful. You would not be able to do much about it. But like three, three air, uh, in the Air Force, just next to Dwarka, 22, 21, and all these places. I don't know what the people are suffering, going to suffer. The children, somebody should make a study of that area because the landing and takeoffs are below 1,000 meters. At 1,000 meters, all the sulfur dioxide that is coming out of the contrails are falling on these places. People can't see it. So you don't see the airline. You see the car, so we complain all the time about cars, but we don't see the big picture where India is going to lose the race in fighting pollution if they don't take care of the airlines that is growing at a very rapid pace. And I'm seeing every day I travel up and down India now in the last nine months, I see new travelers in every year. Whichever corner of India you go, now we have got the first time flyers. So it's going to go up and we need to be the Brookings Institute like Brookings should definitely go after it and make a, uh, advise the government of India to have a better policy with regard to airlines and how they plan to control it. Thank you. Last question and then, and one more. Can you, Alex or anyone, speak about linearity or non-linearity in the impacts, uh, dose response may be too specific a term, but in general, so there is bad pollution. Now you expend money to reduce it. Now would you rather reduce the 500 to 400 or would you rather reduce the 150 down to 100, whether you normalize by percentage or something else? Uh, what is the evidence or the economics? Say? Because that's a critical question. I mean, in an ideal world, all of the above, these are not mutually exclusive, but in practice, um, I'm Bhadet Kapoor from Indian Statistical Institute. Uh, Alex, I have a sort of a theoretical question, which is that it, it's sort of a Malthusian framework in which pollution goes up, productivity goes down, consumption should go down, pollution level goes down. Productivity goes up again, consumption goes up. So are we in some kind of a cycle? You know, the economics model that you've suggested would suggest that at some level, we've got to price the consumption right, which I think is not what is happening due to the air pollution being such a large externality. Nobody wants to sort of pay locally for it. 
So are we going to be stuck in this cyclical behavior of consumption declining? You'll have a crisis. Millions of people will die. Again, economic growth will happen. Again, pollution will go up. Again, millions will die. So the cycle will continue. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, Deepak, can I ask you about, uh, I mean, one of the questions was about how the evidence can be pitched to policy. And since uh, UNEP is coordinating with uh, two ministries, uh, how how is the evidence uh, taken in and how, how do you guys in, in this, uh, uh, I mean, in, the, in this initiative <laughs> now, is, is there room for more uh, evidence to be provided to them um, in, in terms of like on a common platform? open for all or maybe uh, being, uh, um, I mean at least uh, institutes like ICMR or other institutes as well can pitch their research and are they more open to evidence that way? Um, I think uh, when it comes to Ministry of Health, they are definitely <coughs> working. In fact, they are working very closely with institutes like ICMR. They've actually set up a center on environmental health mm -hmm. within the Ministry of Health, which is very active in this space. And a lot of the work they are doing is on demand from, from that sector and in close collaboration with them. Um, I think with the Ministry of Environment, it's, it's a little bit more of a challenge. And I think that is also partly, I would say, because, um, you know, because of the mandate of the ministry. You see, that they are, at the end of the day, they are only monitoring and reporting air quality data. Whereas the interventions to address air quality, uh, air quality, uh, really have to come from multiple ministries. So I think it's, it's also a little bit unfair to sort of put all the onus of, um, of the issue on um, the Ministry of Environment and hold them answerable and accountable for the issue. So I think it's, it's really important and I think that's why sometimes the Ministry gets defensive about this issue. I think it's, it's very important that uh, you know, we have this multi-sectoral, multi-ministerial engagement to uh, address this issue. And uh, we hope that with the NCAP, <laughs> the International Clean Air <coughs> this should, should be sort of, you know, that the NCAP should facilitate this process. Because as I understand it, in several states now, um, there are these uh, committees that have been formed which are being directly supervised by the Chief Secretary. So it's no longer within the environment department, but it is something which is being coordinated across departments at the sort of more senior leadership, uh, top level um, leadership in the states. So one is hoping that with this kind of an approach, uh, some of these issues uh, on, on policy, because it's really, I mean, if you look at the source apportionment studies across India, there is no one sector which is responsible for um, the, the majority share of air pollution. Uh, it, it varies by region, it varies by season, so it's really we have to address um, um, multiple sectors and multiple sources of air pollution and this can only happen in, in this integrated framework. So our endeavor as UNEP is to now work of course with, with the central government but also more with city governments, with state governments, but that's where a lot of the action is going to happen and to facilitate this kind of coordinated approach to addressing air pollution. And so, um, sorry, go ahead. Oh, so uh, let me address a few of the questions which have uh, come up. Um, so there's this issue of uh, airplanes and so forth, and I actually think with all due respect, this is the wrong approach, okay? Because there is an approach which says that we must sacrifice, that the way to reduce pollution is we must cut our consumption, we must cut the good things in life, we must fly less, we must do less of these things. And I think that is, first of all, is incorrect, and second of all, that is a politically a very dangerous uh, and, and a wrong-headed approach because people will say no. People will say, I'm not willing to sacrifice. Instead, what I think we see going on is that there's actually lots of low-hanging fruit. There's actually lots of low-value uh, activities which generate a lot of pollution. We've already raised the issue of stubble burning. Um, the stubble burning is not a big deal for the farmers. It's not a high-value production activity for uh, uh, India as a whole. This is a very a low value, low profit activity, and yet it generates a lot of pollution. So here's a situation where there is in fact 
uh, abundant opportunities for a win-win solution because the cost of that stubble burning is so much higher than the benefits even to the farmers. So there's a possibility of a win-win. We can all be better off. I think we have to tell the farmers also not, you must cut stubble burning in order to protect the citizens of Delhi. That's not going to work. Instead, we have to tell the farmers something which is true, which is this is killing your own children. So uh, there's a much more opportunities here for uh, win-win solutions. Another issue is, think about coal, okay? Now the thing about coal, it's actually very expensive to get it out of the ground. So coal is a low profit uh, industry because you take a, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of cost to get it out of the ground, and then you burn it and it kills people. So coal is a, is a, is a low hanging fruit because if India can move from coal to solar, and India happens to be very well placed to have a, a huge increase in solar production at low cost, then this is a win-win solution because the coal is not generating a lot of profit. Okay? It has high cost to get it out of the ground and then you sell it for a little bit more than the cost. It's not a high profit industry. So you could uh, reduce that industry considerably okay, without cutting GDP and at the same time make people much healthier. You can make them healthier and wealthier at the same time. So I, I think what the uh, issue that has to be solved is there's a lot of low-hanging fruit, there's a lot of room for win-win solutions if you look more broadly. So, I mean, just to add to it, um, no one is saying no to air force, but I think your point was more about better urban planning. Better urban planning plus the government should have policies, you know, so simply you're allowing more and more airports near residential areas is not the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. So you have to have public transportation where people can travel long distance, let's say 30 miles away from these places. If they open a new area, if there's an open area, build an airport and let them take off of like they're doing in Beijing, Turkey and all these places. They're moved away from the urban area. So the having, instead of having three airports, combine the airports, spend the money to build somewhere else far away. So people can have public transportation to go up and down. Make it efficient. Say it will take 10 years to build that. Mm -hmm. 2030. Mm -hmm. I have a plan for 2030 for Delhi to have all these airports moved out of the urban area. What happens to those people in Dwarka? Nobody is looking at it. Just to add on to this point, and also the point raised by Alex. Uh, so, as a user, uh, as a user, all the new things that are coming up online streaming, and then uh, this whole aspirational culture of shopping, getting things from the US, I mean, all of that adds to the carbon footprint. So even if we address the low-hanging fruits, we are also adding a lot of carbon footprint on the other side, because all no, no, the new no. technologies that are coming up. No, 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 technology is lowering carbon footprint. Online is less, so all of these technologies that we have are, are reducing, There's less resources are, uh, electrons are much less polluting if you get it from a good electricity source, like solar, uh, electricity is much less producing. The world we live in, if you live in a virtual world, you have more online, you use less resources. So we're moving to a world, in fact, where the GDP per unit of resource is going up. So we have fewer, we're using fewer resources to produce more GDP, and that's part of the online world. And so we have to embrace the future. We have to say, in order to reduce pollution, we need to move forward, not move backward. We need to move forward into more online. We need to move forward into an information age uh, world. Not tell people, no, you cannot have this. You cannot be rich like in the United States. That is not going to fly. You have to tell people, no, we need to be more like uh, the leading economies of the world, which produce more GDP with fewer resources. So I think that's the, the approach uh, that one should take. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Abhishek. Uh, I work with media. Uh, a small observation here. Uh, I think I, I agree to what she said about the point about materialism and moving to the westernization trend. Uh, moving forward, uh, I think we need to be very clear. Uh, do we want to move the Atlanta way of cars or do we want to move the Amsterdam way of cycles of forward? So I think moving forward is also a very subjective thing. Where do we want to see ourselves as India going forward? Uh, 
a small question here. Uh, uh, you've talked a lot about uh, the effect of air pollution on the public health and how it impacts and deteriorates. But do you see uh, a differentiated uh, weighted average on some of the pollutants being very high uh, detrimental to the air pollution, for example, PM10, or as Prof, uh, Dr. Dibir mentioned about indoor pollution, which is carbon monoxide. I think it would be a great help to the policy makers if we zoo in on some specific <coughs> pollutants or do we see a specific weight on specific uh, specific high weight on some pollutants which are which can be the lowest hanging or the first uh, mover thing kind of a uh, advantage for us. Thank you. So I think if we've learned anything, I think it's that uh, PM 2.5, which is uh, this very small particulate matter. Uh, what happens is it gets into your bloodstream and it can even get into your brain. So I think it's these super small particles, um, which you don't necessarily smell, they don't necessarily even impede your uh, view, they don't necessarily you know, ruin the sunset, but these very small particles uh, get into your bloodstream and your lungs and into your brain. So I, I think that uh, has been the new finding uh, in recent years. Um, I do think this relates to the question which was asked earlier about whether we know whether there's a sort of a non-linear curve or a linear curve. Um, and I think the answer is we don't know, right? Because not enough uh, studies have been done at very high uh, pollution uh, levels. It could very well be the case, right, that reducing from uh, 500 to 400 or reducing from 500 to 450 that, that could be even bigger, right, than reducing from 100 to 50. That, in which case, that would actually be a very good thing. Or it in, would be meaningless. Yeah, so that's right. I mean, uh, if, yeah, it, 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 it could be that, it, exactly. It, if we, it, so it could be the case that moving from 500 to 450 is much better than moving from 100 to 50, in which case the argument for doing something now is much, much, is even stronger. It could also be the case that after you're, you've hit, you know, 300, you, you can't get any worse, right? In which case, you have to do a lot before you start to see the benefits. My intuition is that it's closer to linear uh, than it is to um, uh, falling off. I don't know that for sure, um, but my intuition from sort of human biology is that things get worse, uh, not moderate. Uh, they don't moderate, you know, uh, 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 like that in general. But I could be wrong. I think we need more studies uh, to know that uh, for sure. If it is the non, if it is the nonlinear case going in the wrong direction, then this means you need to make a big push, right? You need to make a big or push. Or geographically different policies. Correct. Correct. But just to add to that point, I think while the well, we, not, we don't know for, for certain whether the impacts on health are linear or non-linear. We do know that the compound effects of all the pollutants, including uh, the impact of climate change, um, can be non-linear or, or is likely to be non-linear. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so that, that is, I think, the, the caveat that we need to keep in mind, that what's happening in the ecosystem, um, that itself may be non-linear. Whereas the impact, we, we don't know whether it's linear or non-linear, but how the uh, environment responds to these, you know, these uh, doses from different sources and the impacts of climate is itself uncertain and likely to be non-linear. Yeah, we know, for example, that uh, this is sort of a U.S. example may not be totally relevant. I'm not saying it is relevant, but if you're exposed to asbestos and you smoke, that's ten times worse than either asbestos or smoking alone. Right, so these things complement one another in a very bad way. And I suspect this is also true that uh, air pollution and water pollution, I suspect, uh, multiply one another. So the effects could be very large indeed when you have multiple attacks going on at the same time. And uh, one last thing, I'll get back to you later. Uh, just to add to your uh, question about measuring other pollutants, uh, in India currently we rely on ground, ground monitors there are less than, what, 730-odd monitors covering the entire country, which is nothing. Most of them are mostly concentrated in urban areas, which means rural areas where maximum uh, population resides is, is completely ignored. But at the same time, even if we rely on satellite estimates, 
satellite estimates are validated by using uh, ground uh, measurements. So, in order, the, one of the most urgent uh, requirements from at least from a researcher's point of view is certainly to expand the ground uh, measurement uh, network. And that is certainly one of the mandates from in, in the NCAP policy that they should expand and they should have more and more monitors. Uh, so, I'm all on board in terms of having more data on even other pollutants which we currently don't have access to. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it certainly needs to be measured. And, and monitors are cheap. Yeah. They're cheap. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's no excuse for not having many, many more uh, monitors. And when you have monitors, right, then you have something which you can take to the public. You see mm -hmm. this number. And also to the politicians, right? If the politicians can say, look, we've reduced this number. Right, you know, it used to be 300 and now it's only 150 on average. You give them a number to reduce, that's very important that they have a measurable thing like the doing business index, right? Okay, we have the doing business index, it goes, ah, I need to be higher on the index. I need to be higher than, you know, than Karnataka or something like that, right? You have competition among the states. That's another thing yeah. which I think could be helpful here. Uh, if you have monitors and then you have competition among the states, so one state, we have the cleanest air in India, okay, you know, or we have improved the most in the last five years, our state has improved the most in the last five years. These are the kinds of things which uh, people like to see and they like to sell, and this is the way you can get people excited about these kinds of things. Um, thank you for your presentation about the satellite monitors and the ground level monitors and the studies that you used. But uh, please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but uh, uh, have you ever come across a study where they've actually used it in an objective manner? You, come across many studies where they've actually measured the 2.5 in the plant objectively. Yeah, so the, the study I mentioned on India actually when, with garment workers um, has in-plant measures of uh, air quality. I no, know, in, I, the in the blood Oh, the bloodstream, I see. Yeah, I see, I see. Uh, so, so you know, we know right. that this is environment. Right, right. Environmental is there, but what mm. happens in the body, how, mm. that is how we can establish a positive association. Right. Completely. Lots of ones on lead, but I don't know about PM 2.5. I know a few studies from from US where currently mothers are being studied. So in terms of, uh, um, I mean, during while they are pregnant, um, yeah, exactly, fetal growth and the kind of uh, pollutants that might be found in the placenta. Those are very small samples, but certainly ongoing studies in this area. And where they have, for uh, instance, found fine particulate matter. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, in the yeah. Yeah. And how intrauterine growth is possibly restricted because of it is, is, is something that, that these studies are uh, documenting as early evidence. Thank you very much because we were having a discussion whether it can be essayed in blood or not because mm -hmm. we did not get any. Not in India, but yeah, a few studies from other nations. <coughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Just I want to add about the low food that you were talking about. One other thing that is missing here is the enforcement of the traffic. Which is causing more congestion than you could ever imagine. I don't know what happens to this police. Either they take the breakfast, lunch, and tea break only when there is peak traffic. You don't see any of them. So that is another thing lack of enforcement. That's a low flow. If Pongri Daiki showed you very clearly about the whole road, what happened to the easy path, the same thing would happen in every circle in Delhi if there are police controlling and making sure that. And I don't know why the government doesn't understand that having more police is an employment for a country like India, where the fines can be collected and that could act as what we call in the US is most of the California Highway Patrol, their pension is increased because they're more out on the feet, catching people doing their regular things. Same could be applied to India, where their pension, their salary, everything could be paid from the uh, fines. Why don't they think it as an employment? the police and they put them all across the place so the mobility will be better. That's the low hanging fruit they can do. Yeah, I mean, I agree. They, could, they should do it. Better roads and better yes. mobility is the way to Where go. are the police? May not, this policy said. instrument may or may not be more feasible based on uh, the number of people who they can employ, but certainly better mobility and urban planning is... It's a good opportunity yeah. also, training people properly for the future of India. So mm -hmm. it is necessary. Enforcement is zero. You try, I drove 2,000 kilometers from New Delhi to Jodhpur and back, no police, nowhere. So. Yeah. I just wanted to make the sure, sure. 
just wanted to make a comment on, on what Alex said about um, you know material use and the fact that um, technology is enabling us to become more efficient. Um, I think there is conflicting data on that because uh, at the global level, we are, the demand for materials has not come down. So even though technology is improving efficiency, um, that efficiency has been more than overwhelmed by increasing demand. And therefore, I think we also need to look at demand. And, and while it's, it's, it's fair to say that people have the right to aspire to a better living standard, but what is that level of aspiration? And what responsibility do others who are setting that level of aspiration have? It, they, these are important issues when we talk about um, global responsibility and the kinds of environmental pressures that they're facing. Thank you. So we, we are right on time. So thanks a lot for coming here. Uh, Uh, we should, we can all head out and continue our discussion over tea or coffee. Thank you.